Good evening. My name is Danny Anderson. I am the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at the University of Kansas. Um, and I want to thank all of you for being here this evening to help us with a very special celebration. Um, part of the thing that we do each year in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences is recognize some of our most distinguished alumni uh, for their accomplishments uh, once they have left KU. Um, one of the things that if you have spent time at the University of Kansas recently, uh, we've been very clear about our mission in terms of lifting students in society by educating leaders, by building healthy communities, and by making discoveries that change the world. Um, so tonight, we are going to be honoring Dr. Rosemary Tulio. She's an outstanding example of everything that we want our graduates to go and accomplish. Um, and to help us move our way through the evening, um, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kathleen McCluskey Fawcett. She is a professor of psychology and is also the director, director of the University of Kansas Army Program. Kathleen, I'll let you do the introduction of our panel. Thank you, Danny. So I'm going to introduce the panel, and we're going to have a video, and then I'm going to ask some questions of the panel, and then I'm going to So I'd like to introduce Joey Mazarima. He's the head writer, the uh, director, and also a performer. He will be bringing us Murray later on during this period. Murray will be joining us. Um, Carol Parenti, who's the senior vice president and president for creative content and executive producer of Sesame Street. Um, as I said, Murray, oops, Murray will arrive later. And our special guest, Rosemary Trulio, who's the senior vice president for curriculum and content for education research and outreach at Sesame Street. Um, she's been with Sesame Street since 1997. Uh, she came to KU after finishing her undergraduate degree at Rutgers, and she finished her MA in Human Development and Family Life in 1986, and her PhD in 1990 in Development and Child Psychology. She worked with Aletha Houston and John Wright um, in something called Critic, which is, is a uh, research on television center. She has a long and distinguished career at Sesame Workshop, she assesses the role of television in children's development, particularly the socialization and education. She reviews all the scripts for Sesame Street and works with the writers to ensure that the content is developmentally appropriate, uh, safe, and sensitive for all the uh, children of Sesame Street. So there's, she's published numerous articles on the effects of television on cognitive and social development of children. And she also uh, has published uh, G for Growing, which relates to 30 years of research on Sesame Street and children. On a personal note, I've known uh, Rosemary since her undergraduate years. When I was the chair of psychology at West Virginia University, we tried to recruit uh, Rosemary to our graduate program there, but she turned us down and came to KU. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> which is an excellent choice. <laughs> when, um, when, she returned, when I returned to KU in uh, 1985, there she was. Um, I served on her dissertation committee, which was on uh, the media, sex, and teenagers. Um, some of it was kind of explicit, and her parents came to her dissertation. <laughs> um, and I'm not sure who was more embarrassed. <laughs> but it was an excellent dissertation. <laughs> uh, more recently, I have beamed her into my honor shot psychology class through the generosity of the dean. I have a wonderful um, uh, system where I can uh, conferencing system where I can bring people in. And so she has taught a session on children in the media for my students where uh, we have we have all learned a lot. So uh, it's been wonderful. You're clearly a wonderful teacher. Um, the students really enjoy that. Uh, and I'm so happy and proud that you've been honored by the college in this way. And I think I'm supposed to say, cure it, and then we'll be good. <laughs> We want to emphasize that the Children's Television Workshop is an experiment. Research is woven into the total fabric of the show. Every segment is being tested and evaluated by the toughest critics of all, the children themselves. Thirteen. Fourteen. Fourteen. The job is helping children reach their highest potential. We're always looking to identify what are the critical educational needs of children. 
Let's hear you sing the alphabet. A, B, C. One example is we have a literacy crisis that our country has been facing for a while. We've worked with the military on a whole series of shows dedicated to those families and those families' needs. We're in over 150 countries internationally. Programs focus on girls' education, specific health initiatives to mutual respect and understanding. The needs of children are constantly changing. The show is always evolving. That's one of the main reasons why we're still around 40 some odd years later. Today, we are launching the Educate to Innovate campaign, a nationwide effort to help reach the goal this administration has set, moving to the top in science and math education in the next decade. I remember reading the Times and going, we have to teach this. I mean, we're so far behind. Sesame Street has a new mission this season to help American children catch up with the rest of the world in math and science. One of the first things that we do in an initiative is bring a bunch of experts around the table and really hear from them how to best address this issue with children. If they learn a very simple cognitive kind of skill set that we've right. been talking about, they gain a measure of control. When we enter a country internationally, what's really key to our success is that we're working with local partners. Once we get informed by uh, these content advisors, we revise the curriculum and then we start creating content. Now, with our STEM curriculum, we know that children learn through failures. STEM is science, technology, engineering, and math, all sort of in one discipline. We're like, okay, this is a subject we don't know about. Like, how are we supposed to teach it to a three-year-old? I, I know my letter Q. That's easy. That's but it's really it's problem solving is what we found out. I just had my hair done, and now I can't get down from here. You see, I'm a cow, and cows can't walk downstairs. With Supergrove 2.0, we are actually modeling the processes of STEM, but we're also giving children the language of these concepts. Oh, I think you just made a ramp, Super Grover! So what's a ramp? It's working! What's a lever? What's a pulley? We're trying to understand what children know before they're exposed to our content. Can you tell me what a hypothesis is? That's a tricky one. Say like Super Grover. We ask them a whole bunch of questions about particular topics, and then we'll show them some content that addresses that particular subject. How will we ever get this? Heavy yellow up to our list. And what we try to do is make sure that the educational message is embedded in what's funny. <laughs> then after they watch, we want to see what they learn from the content. And how did he get it up? The pulley. That's STEM education for a preschool audience. We did it! We don't just say we're an educational company that makes educational media. We prove it. There are more studies on Sesame Street than any other television show. And for the 40 plus years that we've been around, lots of academic researchers have been focusing on what we're, what we're doing here. But we don't rest on those laurels. We make sure that with each new initiative that we're delivering on what we're promising. We know in our hearts that that's working, but it's also really nice to have evidence from the academic community that, that's really showing an effect. No other program works as hard as we do to make sure that its content is relevant to the lives of children. It's all right. It's entertaining to these children. This stop sign is an octagon! But as they're entertained, they're learning. And that's what one of our founders, Joan Gans Cooney, wanted from the very beginning.
we invited her to give a colloquium uh, at one of my pro seminars at the time. And she came back so excited and she said, I found the perfect graduate program for you. And I said, oh, really, where? And she said, the University of Kansas. And I said, I'm not going. <laughs> <laughs> and she says, well, I will not write another letter of recommendation for you if you don't at least submit an application now. And I then had the great pleasure of receiving a phone call from John Wright, um, who was my mentor, uh, co-mentor with the Houston. And um, he did a great job wooing me. Not that he didn't. <laughs> he really did. And when I, Katie had an interesting application process, to be very honest here. Um, it was the only university that did not have an application fee. And so I said, okay, I'll send an application. I'll keep Carol and Ruby Collier happy, and I'm, I'm still not going. <laughs> but you have to, they list all the faculty, and they don't have your normal selection committee, Francis, I guess, where you, know, you have to then select who you want to study with, and then they read your application, and then they figure out whether or not that's a good fit, because they have a junior colleague model <coughs> that makes you work hand in hand with your um, faculty advisor. So I saw this description, and Mabel Rice is here, who is also a member of the Center for Research on the Influence of Television on Children. And I said, wow, I could be a developmental psychologist and study the effects of media. And I thought that would be an interesting career. Um, I wanted to be more applied, I think. And if you weren't offering that, um, stop slamming <laughs> <laughs> So um, I had to do a lot of soul searching because I have a great family and they lived in Hoboken, New Jersey. And I didn't know if I could actually make that transition to, to the Midwest. And someone said, you got too much emotion going on here. So maybe be more of a researcher and list all of the attributes that you find important in um, a graduate program. And geographic location, of course, is one of them. But you have to rank order it and, and just see how the numbers come out. Get the average. And Kansas came out on top. And I said, well, maybe I did that wrong. Um, <laughs> let, me, let me read you the back. And it still came out on top. And so it was the best. Nice 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 <laughs> and I got the best. They were the best formative years of my life. So, can you tell us some of the things you learned at KU that really has informed your leadership at Sesame Street? I think the program that, um, and I have other graduates here um, from the program, um, it really was a junior college model, and we did work <coughs> very collaboratively. And I think, unfortunately, in higher ed, um, students become very siloed and they become very that's not the program that we had. Um, we really helped each other. We learned from each other. And uh, we supported each other in our academic pursuits. And um, it was that collaboration. So Francis, when you put that model together, you did something right. Because it's that collaboration that really has helped me grow professionally. And it's, and it's one of the reasons why I asked my colleagues here to join me tonight talk about the collaboration. To teach us how to actually do it right? No. <laughs> um, because when you create something as magical as Sesame Street, um, it takes a lot of great people to work together. And I think that's what this <coughs> represents. And that's what I learned at the University of Texas. That was actually one of my questions. Can you talk about the three of you, how you go from concept uh, through particular episodes, say concept, to the process where you actually then have a finished episode. Well, we just did it now when I came, because uh, I have a daughter who's African American and I went to Rosemary because I really wanted to deal with skin color. It's not something that's in our curriculum that long. We don't deal with it very much on the nose. And I went to Rosemary and I said, I want to deal with, like, if somebody tells you you're um, too good. Like, I read a book and it's, uh, I won't mean the book, but it's a kid's book and it's about picking a dog. But in the book, they, she's trying to pick a fancy dog and she says something's too brown. And I was like, 
I, I skipped the line because I'm reading it to my, but to use it in a pejorative sentence like that to a kid could be really, give her some kind of uh, complex about it. So I went, I wanted to address this, and I went to Rosemary and I said, how can we deal with it? Can we deal with it head on? She got so excited. She goes, yeah, nobody deals with it head on. I'll get back to you tomorrow. <laughs> and it's like her team gets into action, and they find me an advisor by the next week, and Autumn's on the phone, and Sue's on the phone, and everybody, and it's, um, it's just amazing. They are like, it's a great process, and, and Rosemary, of all the kids in the nation who have learned anything from Rosemary, it's me, because now I know STEM, and now I know executive <laughs> function, all these things that I just, I never knew. But it's a, it's a great process. And I think um, it's always funny, as often as we sort of talk about what we do, we always wind up sitting in this configuration, which is uh, really the functional representation of how we work. So I'm in the middle. <laughs> I'm supposed to kill a joke, Carolyn. <laughs> and I have really long arms. <laughs> um, so it, it really is the way we work in that there's a, a, often a disconnect between the messaging we want to send and the comedy that the writers come up with and that's my role in terms of trying to balance that we have enough of each because um, I think Rosemary will always say, she'll make suggestions and she'll say, I'm not a writer, I'm not funny, but the fact of the matter is Rosemary has a great sense of humor and it's the reason this collaboration works so well. Not only is there the utmost respect almost all of the time <laughs> um, for what we do, there's a, a great sense of humor, Rosemary brings to the table, and a great knowledge base now over the years that Joey has from working with Rosemary and your team. So no, I do, I really do. I mean, I think in years past there was a, a little bit of a, a struggle between the research and the writers, and I don't think that's there anymore. I really do. When I go into with research and I meet on scripts, if we're not reaching the kid and, and teaching them, what is the point? So I, I have the other question. Who's got their cell phone on? Come on. <laughs> Responsibilities I, I have with my team and my team is, is representing here. Let's hear it from the research department. <laughs> He's persistent, he keeps trying, but he doesn't get right. 
And so I said, we cannot have Super Grover be the host of this format. We've got to get it right. We've got to teach children the basic uh, concepts for, for STEM. And they were right. They were right. And here's an example of, yes, I have all this academic knowledge, and I want to keep it pure, and I want to be able to be explicit, but you can't lose the humor. And the reason why they were right is because Super Grover really epitomizes STEM education because it's about trial and error. It's about learning from your errors. It's about being persistent. And I hand it to you, both of you, for, for getting it right. <laughs> we have, we have you have witnesses. <laughs>
said, that's my answer. Uh, one of the things parents are really concerned about now is screen time. Kids spending so much They want more screen time? They want more screen time. They should. More screen time. Uh, in terms of TV and tablets and, <laughs> and computers and you know, putting babies in front of Sesame Street or, you know, and their baby carriers. Do you have, can you talk a little bit about sort of what Sesame Street's take on that is? Sure. John Wright taught me this, and I think it still holds true. Um, content matters, and I think that's probably one of the most important messages that I want to convey. Um, yes, if there's too much screen time, it's not good, because too much of anything is not, is not good. Um, but I urge parents to really be selective in what they have their children watch. Sesame Street is a curriculum-driven show, um, and there's some other great shows out there, which I love to watch Breaking Bad. <laughs> <laughs> He's a chemistry teacher. <laughs> I know most of the periodic table now, just from the crew list. Murray, we have to talk, Murray. Is that that? All right. Go back in the bed, Murray. So content, content matters, and I urge people not to put the babies in front of Sesame Street, because they're really not comprehending much. Um, Dan Anderson's research shows that prior to 18 months, it's, it's visual stimulation for them, but they really can't comprehend um, the, the, the content. Um, but um, we take great care and pride in making sure we execute on these educational goals. And the other thing that we do really well is write it on two levels, because we want to bring the adult into the situation. Sesame Street is not a, a purely a child experience. It really is an experience that we want uh, families to watch together. And that togetherness enhances the educational value of the show. And that's why we have the celebrities, and that's why Murray's out in the street, so New York are talking to adults. It's true, that's what we do. And you know, great credit to everyone on the team, especially recently, that they let us, you know, Sons of, when we do a Sons of Anarchy uh, parody. That was hard. <laughs> <laughs> that was hard. Sons of Anarchy. Yeah, yeah, that was hard. Uh, but I think to recognize that younger audience, though, it is there. There's not much we can do about that. So we're very careful that the, the content is also done in a physical manner that can that those younger viewers can follow along and, and um, not get lost in, in the complicated content that we do. So that we are cater the show towards them, we acknowledge that they're watching and trying to tell really physical stories. Questions from the audience? I know many of you are part of this testing workshop. Yes? So, so there's no A in STEM. I'm just wondering if she could address the role of art in the... STEAM plus A. Was that a plan? Did you get the there for the STEM plus A people C? It's STEM No, it's no, no. I take the renovated beats. Encouraging us to, you know, what's next? What kind of spin can, can you uh, add to the great season of STEM, and what, how are you going to advance it? And then our PR department and marketing department said, "Well, yeah, if we, if we talked about STEM, what, what's next?" So we decided to look at the A and um, realized that it was a mistake not to include the arts because when you're talking about really young children, the arts are what is relevant to them, and that's what's familiar to them. So why not use the arts as a tool and use the arts as a way to teach STEM education? So uh, for season 43, the subsequent uh, year, we did a STEM plus A equals STEAM curriculum, and they created yet another new format with Elmo. I don't know if you want to talk about Elmo. That really was, you know, Elmo musical, a new format that has a math focus, but it's done through through the, with the tool of the arts, so Elmo is always making up um, and play acting a, um, a different musical um, story. And so, and throughout the season, there were many other, other ways that we, you know, arts is a really important tool when it comes to engaging. And that's partly what is so important for us to do, get those kids in and then, you know, teach them a lesson. So the arts was, uh, using that STEAM um, curriculum was really 
great for us because it opened the doors to all sorts of engaging um, opportunities we have beyond the preschool. And I think what's unique about Sesame is that we have a whole child curriculum, but it's the only show that revises its curriculum on an annual basis. And we're, we're very nimble, we're very flexible. So that question was a good one. You know, you started out with the STEM curriculum, what about the arts? Okay, we'll address the arts and now we'll, we'll, we'll uh, create a STEAM curriculum. And when she says flexible, I just want to say every time they come to the writers, my like, contest say we have to do this week, the first thing we always yes. say is, but it's not going to work, we can't do it. There's no way to teach that for us, no, we can't. And that's when Carolyn comes in, <laughs> because then I go to her office and I say, he won't listen to me. And she's let him relax and give him some time. <laughs> yeah, I'm really, I'm really happy that in season 44 we started focusing on executive functions. Self-regulation. <laughs> <laughs> Self-regulation. That's Self really coming in handy for me on a daily basis. <laughs> oh, but that's truly how I go around to something. If the writers don't start with that, too hard, can't be done, then I, I know we're on to yeah. something really good, because everything good starts from that. And, that and you have a reaction to STEAM, because the writers took the STEM curriculum so seriously. They wanted to get the science right. They wanted to make sure that we didn't um, miscommunicate anything or were uh, conveying misinformation to, to, to young children. And we um, so wanted to make sure they had the foundational skills. Right. And so when he said, well, now we're going to do some arts, you had a reaction to it. I did. I called it a big pile of steam. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think it was real. I didn't think it like, because all the examples were that art, like, was teaching steam, but it wasn't truly one of the integrated parts of it. That's what it felt like. But I think we found ways to make it. Sure. Other questions? <coughs> Uh, uh, Lucas. Lucas! Hello, sir! What do you want to know about your mom? I'll tell you. What is your main goal? What is my main goal? Um, my main goal in what? what in, in, in life or tonight? What is Sesame Street's mean? Oh, that's great. That's for you. That's, great. that's, for you. that's, that's a question. really good question. Really, really great. Wow. Wow. Uh, well, the mission of Sesame uh, Workshop and Sesame Street. Oh, your main goal. You can't sit on the It's a political campaign. Oh, okay. Main You know, when you think of 
success, I mean, people always think of the letters and numbers, but we are a whole child curriculum, and health has always been a part of the curriculum, but we decided to put the health goals under the spotlight when we realized there was an obesity crisis, and it was starting very young, it was starting during the preschool years, and we decided that we are about the foundational skills, and we got to instill those healthy habits for life young, because that's when they learn those all. And so we brought in, uh, as we always do, advisors. Um, and we also did baseline research, and Jen Faulkner is here, um, which was really interesting for me to go talk to the children. What do they know about what it means to be healthy? And they would say things like, um, I'll not get sick. Okay, that's great. But what do you do not to get sick? Well, you have to eat healthy foods. Well, what are healthy foods? Um, French fries. <laughs> Uh, and we know those French fries are not healthy foods. Why are they? Yeah. Why, why are they healthy? Well, they're potatoes. Yeah. So, so we realized that we had to do a lot in terms of educating children how to define what healthy foods are. The children very rarely mentioned physical exercise. So we realized that we need to have a, a comprehensive curriculum. We have to address healthy foods and encourage them to try the foods and, and hopefully like the foods, but also the importance of moving on uh, their bodies and the importance of sleep and uh, relaxation. So we put together this wonderful curriculum, great content, um, and it's not just addressed domestically, it's addressed, it's addressed around, around the world. Other questions? Oh, I hear <laughs> discuss the accomplishments of one of our graduates. Um, you know, there are many people who would be thrilled to be right here close uh, to individuals who help make so many things happen. Uh, Muppet Sesame Street has a great cool factor, um, but what impressed the advisory board the most uh, was when they looked at all the things that go on behind the scenes. Um, and you've seen here the way that uh, Dr. Trulio talked about what she received from her graduate program at KU. Uh, the ways that she learned to lead uh, in a collaborative style so that it brings forth the very best and when you're thinking about both the intellectual and the creative and everything that she tries to accomplish. Um, and we are very proud uh, when we think about what it means for Jayhawks to look at someone like Dr. Trulio in terms of the impact that she has had uh, through her work at Sesame Workshop. So as distinguished alum alumna of the college at KU, Dr. Trulia belongs to a very elite group. Uh, we have had past recipients who were the president of Colombia, uh, a Nobel Prize winner. We've had an astronaut. There are judges, lawmakers, entertainers, artists, uh, many more. The list is long. Uh, so, Rose Marie, it's a real pleasure if you'll come forward. Uh, this is a token of uh, the award that we're giving to you um, as the College Distinguished Alumni. Thank you for all that you've done. I'm sorry. 
this to our Columbia Grammar ice skating annual event. And I said, I'm, I really got to run. And he said, no, no, I need, I need 30 seconds to tell you about this award. And, and I could not believe what he was saying to me because I, I those of you who know me, I'm very humble and very modest. And I, and I said, well, how did this happen? And he then went on to explain the whole selection process. And I went, no, 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 how did they pick me? <laughs> so I am very honored and I am proud to be uh, a Jayhawk. So thank you, Dean Anderson, for presenting this award to me and for your kind words of praise. Dr. Dr. McCluskey Fawcett, Kathleen, um, you are the one who nominated me, and I am so honored that you uh, took the time to acknowledge my accomplishments, and you thought that I was worthy to receive this award, so, so thank you. And you did a superb job moderating, moderating tonight. It's not always easy working with a Muppet, so thank you. <laughs> Joey, you did a great work on great behavior. I told Joey that this was um, not a roast. any meetings about the agenda first in the future. And he did, he did a great job, so. I'm sure we're going to pay for it at the next writer's meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and special thanks to the selection committee for bestowing upon me this honor. Thank you, Carolyn and Joey, for being panelists to illustrate what we accomplished together. We do it together to address the critical needs of children. I don't do it alone, and I couldn't have better partners and better friends in, in this wonderful collaboration, so thank you. I extend my gratitude to all of you who have come this evening to share this special time with me. A special guest, a special thanks to my family, friends, my staff, and my colleagues from Sesame Workshop. At a recent company-wide staff meeting, our CEO, who unfortunately could not be here this evening, Melvin Bean, shared a quote from Jim Collins, the author of Good to Great, Why Some Companies Make the Leap and Others Don't. While this quote is about companies, the words struck me as I prepared my remarks for this evening. I take the quote out of context, but the message is, it is very difficult to have a meaningful life without meaningful work. There's rare tranquility that comes from knowing that you've had a hand in creating something of intrinsic excellence that makes a contribution. You might even gain the deepest of all satisfactions, knowing that your short time here on this earth has been well spent and mattered. I am truly fortunate that my career path led me to Sesame Street. My staff, colleagues, and I create meaningful content that benefits children around the world. While I stand here alone, please know that I would never be here without the love, support, and guidance of so many meaningful people in my life. I wish my parents could be here, but I know they're watching from above. While they didn't always understand my academic pursuits, they believed in me and trusted that others more educated than them were guiding me down the right path. And many of you had a great privilege to spend time with my family, uh, especially in Lawrence, and I know you all have very fun memories of them. The path began at Douglas College, Rutgers University, Valerie and Eileen. Thank you for coming to this event as representatives of Douglas College. At Douglas, I not only received an excellent undergraduate education, but it helped me develop the confidence to pursue the graduate degree in developmental psychology. In 2005, I was honored to be inducted into the Douglas Society for Distinguished Achievement. It was at Douglas that I first met my first mentor, Dr. Carolyn Roby Collier. I mentioned her uh, during the panel discussion. I was an eager undergraduate 
I knew I had to get involved in research, and I'm grateful that she recognized something in me to give me a chance to be a part of her research team. Unfortunately, Carolyn is not well enough this evening to attend, but I did call her, and I wanted her to know that I was receiving this award. And when I called her uh, to thank her for being my mentor and for encouraging me to apply to the University of Kansas, she said this, I showed you the door, but you are the one who walked through the door. I thought that was very gracious of her. But I reminded her that she was instrumental in shining a light so I could see the door. She asked that I be the light for others, and I told her I will try my very best. And I hope that my former students at Teachers College Columbia University, two of them are here, and I'm very proud of your accomplishments. My staff, and I hope you all see that I continue to hopefully do my best to be mentors and to be a light in your accomplishments. Dr. Rogi Holly was my connection to the University of Kansas, but the conduit is Dr. Francis Horowitz, the former chair of the Department of Human Development and Family Life and the former dean of the University of Kansas. Francis, Little did you know that your invitation to Carolyn to give that lecture would subsequently inspire her to open up my eyes to the exceptional program you helped establish and develop at KU. Francis, you too have served as a mentor in my life and guided me at a very important crossroad in my career. Thank you for your sage advice, your belief in me, and your support, which helped me to make the transition from academia, academia to Sesame Workshop. Thank you, Francis. I'm incredibly grateful to my KU mentors, Dr. John Wright and Alifa Houston. I'll never forget the day sitting in my dorm room and receiving a call from John. He was impressed with my senior honors thesis. It involved working with preschoolers and giving them a series of memory tasks. Joey, memory tasks, see how it came, it's coming back. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't remember. Executive <laughs> And the reward for the children who got the memory uh, tests correct, they got to watch a brief clip of Winnie the Pooh. Not Sesame Street, but Winnie the Pooh. I guess that was the beginning of my career in children's television, but I had no idea at the time. I finally took John's advice to go to KU without visiting the campus and work at the Center for Research on the Influences of Television on Children. And Mabel Rice, it's such a great honor to have you here this evening. She was uh, part of Critic and was actually there the day that I arrived at mid-August with my brothers. It was during these formative years that I gained the knowledge and skills to become a developmental psychologist. I also learned about the power of educational television, in particular, the educational benefits of Sesame Street. My years at KU also taught me the value of friendship and the importance of collaboration. We supported and nurtured each other's growth. In many ways, KU helped me grow up. I was only 20 years old when I arrived on the campus of KU. My education at KU helped me to further develop values that were instilled by my parents, and the friends I made at KU became my family. I'm truly touched that two of those friends, Michelle and Jane, traveled from Colorado and Wisconsin to celebrate with me tonight. To my family. I don't know about you, but I'll never forget that Sunday morning we gathered around the kitchen table which is something Italian families do. Everything gets discussed around the kitchen table. To let them know that I made my decision to attend KU. My mother was devastated. <laughs> my neighbors are here as well, who live next door, who also watched me grow up. I'm sure they heard her screams through the kitchen <laughs> She didn't die of a heart attack then, Dr. Zach. <laughs> 
getting something right. <laughs> My father was incredibly supportive. And probably was the first time that mommy actually listened to him and he said, we have to let her go. She made this decision. She must know that she's doing something right. My brothers were there as well as my sister-in-law, Donna, and they did everything that they could to keep her, to, come, to get her to calm down. She was pretty um, distraught. And Joey, I know if you were there that Sunday morning, you would have done your part as well. Never in my wildest dreams did I imagine that one day we would be gathered here in New York City receiving this award from the University of Kansas. The morning I left mid-August back in 1983, I drew on the love and support of my nuclear family, extended family, neighbors, and friends. In fact, they had a little going away party at Don and Joe's apartment with all the neighbors. Uh, um, gathered around their dining room table. My brothers took the long journey with me to Lawrence, Kansas. Joseph and I rode in his new Regal, um, which he gave me and lasted the seven years that I had. I actually passed it on to, <laughs> to Michelle. That car went through quite an experience and actually gave it a nickname, um, Chuck, for all yes. the um, it's wonderful attributes. Um, my brother Steve, my brother Steve, well, Charlie Brown. It was really from Charlie Brown. Let's not go there. Let's not go there. Okay? <laughs> not Chucky, not Chucky. <laughs> my brother Steve followed closely behind in the Trulia's meat market van. I don't know if he gave me the van to take, it, take me to Kansas, I don't know, with all my belongings. One of the hardest goodbyes that morning was kissing my 19-year-old niece, Lucy, goodbye, who was asleep in her crib. She eventually forgave me for moving so far away and became a collector of Jayhawk products that I <laughs> brought back and I brought back on my business home. It didn't take long for the whole family to become Katie fans and proudly hung the Kansas Jayhawk poster in the butcher shop window. <laughs> and when my brother saw the Jayhawks there, he's like, I want one to bring back to the store tomorrow. <laughs> and so, I'm sure we can give him one. To my nieces, Lucy and Joanna, and my nephew, Stephen, I am proud of your accomplishments and careers. And I hope that I guided you in some small way. Lastly, and most importantly, I wouldn't have my amazing career without the constant love and support of my husband, Steve, and our son, Lucas Albert, who we got to see Lucas with, when he raised his hand with a question. And I'm really proud that you did that, sweetie. I love you both with my whole heart. I am blessed with meaningful work, but I am truly blessed to have you both in my life helping me be the best that I can be. Steve, I know it's not easy being there. <laughs> Is she constantly assessing you, Steve? <laughs> Yeah.
Thank you. 